Um, welcome, everyone. I'm Nancy Snyderman. I'm a head and neck surgical oncologist um, here with my surgical oncologist, my medical oncologist, and we're, of course, going to talk about cancer as a, um, is it a bore or is it a moonshot? And we will look at it thir at the whole problem at 36,000 feet. But I want to remind you all that you're part of this conversation. So you can send in your questions um, by emailing the following, WMIF2016 E2 at gmail.com. And we will work your questions in. So, Monica, fellow <laughs> surgeon, is, are, as we look at cancer, and I'm just gonna say right now, present day, are we talking about a moonshot or are we talking about a war? Well, so I'm the surgeon, right? So <laughs> it's going to be a war. A war. A war, absolutely. Um, you know, the reason I conceive of it as a war is if you is from the patient's perspective. If you're thinking about any one individual faced with the disease, there's no doubt your mentality has got to be this is a war. And you know, in academia, we you know we like to think about. We, we're struggling with the biology, we're struggling to understand it as a whole picture and put everything together so that we can do the most we can for the most people we can. But when you're that specific individual, it's not just some big dream of some you know, huge, uh, huge cure. It's your own personal battle, your personal journey, and, and your cure to get there. So Daniel, I'm gonna let you as the medical <laughs> oncologist take up the moonshot idea. So I think the, what I like about the moonshot idea is that it really reflects the way that progress happens in cancer. So it's not a, just a linear progression of small discoveries. They're often times, and they're often technologically based when there's a big step forward. So we all get concerned with moonshots when we think that it's something that's not doable, which will soak up a lot of money that could otherwise go for good research. We get excited about moonshots when there's a real goal that is worth doing and of the ones that we're show showcasing in the next couple of days, immunology, against, fighting the, with the immune system against cancer, uh, chromatin regulators, early detection of cancer. These are all areas where a lot of progress needs to be made. And a lot of this is new knowledge and new technologies. So let's talk about early detection for a second, because whether you're talking about a moonshot or whether you're talking about war, there is increasingly a conversation among all people interested in cancer about the role of early diagnosis, over-treatment of patients, and since not all cancers are the same, when do you just say less is more? I would go with two principles. One of them is that if you have a billion cancer cells in a body, no matter how good the treatments are, if you shrink those billion cells down to a million, some of them will be resistant. And ultimately, cancer will, re will regrow and become resistant. So we have to find a way of diagnosing cancer when it's at an earlier stage. The question of when is it invasive, when is it damaging, when is it something you want to do something about is very, very important. One of the ways that we're looking at that, and one of the powerful ways is to look in the blood at, at signs of invasiveness, which can hopefully differentiate the less indolent cancers with the more aggressive ones. So as a surgeon, I mean, let's just talk breast or prostate for a second, the two that really get the attention for over-treatment. Right. Early detection means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, patient or physician. Right. If, if any one of us live long enough, we all get cancer. You know, and, and under, I mean, age is still the number one risk factor for cancer. Age is still the number one risk factor for cancer. All of us probably have tumors right now sitting in this room we don't know about that will never hurt us. And understanding, and it's a spectrum. You know, it's generally not, we believe, an all or nothing event. That's probably rare. And understanding when intervention needs to happen and when we can afford to wait and watch is one of the most critical problems of, you know, of our time. Understanding the biology intimately is something that will get us there. And the reason it's so important is the way we are going to achieve real cures in any significant way is to prevent the malignancy in the first place. So it, knowing how to understand that switch is absolutely crucial. So when you talk about preventing cancers in the first place, we go back to the sort of boring things that people yep. don't want to talk about, which are lifestyle issues, yeah. right? Diet, exercise, don't smoke. 
And, and, you know, one of our conversations was, before we started this, was where are we going to be for in 10 years? Right. And in 10 years, I mean, we are starting to see real benefits from smoking cessation in, in our country, certainly. We don't know what e-cigs are going to do, but we know that we're starting to see some decrease related to that. We know that um, aspirin is reducing some epithelial tumors, probably reducing the rate of colorectal cancers. So that is reducing mortality. Um, and in 10 years, I think we'll see substantial gains from that because it takes 10 years for those, those prevention modalities to really show benefit. So Dan, I'm, go ahead. How do you see the, the, the conversation in 10 years? Well, I, I think they come together. For example, one of the best things that's come out of our screening clinic, we screen all smokers with a low-dose CAT scan to look for the fine early nodules. But not only is there a question then of finding the nodule and what do you do with which nodule, every person, every smoker who comes to that clinic gets anti-smoking counseling as well. So in some way, screening for cancer comes along with prevention and lifestyle changes as well. I'm just going to get a little granular on that for a second. When you talk about people who smoke getting a CT scan, it sounds like casting a wide net. What are the parameters for being scanned? It's basically a 30-pack year smoking history and uh, age around 55 to 65. So really, the parameters where you're at the highest risk. Having said that, about half of the patients being scanned have some abnormality on a CAT scan, and only 2% of those end up being cancer. So it points to the challenge for early screening, which is that you have a very wide net, but then you need specific tests, whether they're molecular imaging, whether they're blood-based, whatever the tests are, they need to add specificity to that. So take me 10 years from now. Will we be talking about surgeons in a historic way? Oh, I so, think so. <laughs> I, it pains me to say this, but I think that 10 years from now, the surgeons are going to be the ones to cure cancer. I think really? That, and that I is not what I thought you would say. I think say. we're doing that now. It's, it's not just because we're wearing these little yellow roses, <laughs> but we actually like each other. And what I would argue is that we're testing a lot of new, ter new therapies now for cancer, whether they're immuno or targeted therapies. They will all work best in the adjuvant setting where you have a tiny cancer that's taken out and you pre prevent it from coming back rather than treating it. So 10 years from now, I think the big question will be we catch cancers early. It'll be a question of which one is indolent, which one can be cured by Monica, which one will be cured by Monica with a radiation colleague or a targeted therapy colleague. And ironically, we, I'm hoping that we'll have a whole armamentarium of therapies, and the toughest question will be which one to apply that's most cost effective and has the least side effects. Which of course begs the question of the democratization of DNA and the genome and the specifics of tumors. What should people be doing now to be a part of the bigger conversation, the DNA pool, if you will, and what does that look like 10 years from now? Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> um, you know, there's one thing that we know very clearly is that we are in an uh, information deluge. Even now, we have difficulty handling the amount of information, understanding and processing the amount of information we receive from our patients. What we hope to see in the future is that that information is going to be the key to specific treatment, and everyone needs to know that and participate in the acquisition of that knowledge base, and the, most important, the sharing of that knowledge base that's going to, you know, allow us to develop and manage new treatments for patients. Learning healthcare system, all of our hospitals need to step up and really take a role in sharing information. And by and large, our patients all allow us to do it, right? It's very, very rare that a patient will say, don't share my data. It's very common. So are we that all agreeing that HIPAA is a bad law? I'm sorry? Are we all agreeing that HIPAA is sort of a bad law? <laughs> Like I said, it's very rare that a patient says no, but it's very common that we just don't have the structure and the time and the everything we need to make it happen. We need to fix that. I think there's an interesting lesson if you look back at familial breast cancer and BRCA mutations. About 10, 20 years ago, it wasn't clear why anybody should be tested, whether there would be discrimination on the basis of genetics, and what you could do with that information. And if you fast forward to where we are today, not only are there different screening regimens, but there's actually different treatment if your cancer happens to have this mutation. Now, as Monica said, we have a whole array of genetic risk factors, environmental and personal habit risk factors, so it's much more complicated. But it's easy to imagine that 10 years from now, you define someone's risk factor based on genetics, environment, and habits, 
And then there are particular screening or early detection applications focused on those individuals based on that risk. So a question from the audience just came in. Um, <clears throat> To say, with refer, reference uh, to previous uh, neuro, uh, scientists, physician scientists, would our predecessors be surprised that immunotherapy is back in the news in a big way, considering the proponents years ago? Some are turning in their graves. <laughs> Some are turning in their graves. <laughs> no. We, I mean, the promise of the immune system has been there since it was first diagnosed, right? This is how our body gets rid of bad things. It's a normal mechanism. And we're not surprised that it took us a long time. So let me stop you there for a second. Yeah. For the number of times you have stuck your finger in the OR right. while operating on a cancer patient, and you have not succumbed to the cancer of the person you've been operating on, take me into the immune system as to how that gets shut down. Why doesn't a patient's cancer cells, when they get into you, just start growing as a cancer? Oh, well, I'm a completely different human being than that person. So your body chops them up. Tumor. Yeah, so it knows how to get rid of non-self. Unfortunately, cancer looks like self, right? And there are things about it that are alien, that, but there's just enough about it that says, I belong here somehow by whatever tricks the cancer is, is pulling that makes the, humans, the person's immune system unable to respond. We're finally beginning to understand how to turn the switch to make it aware of the fact that these cells don't belong there. I think there's a magical circle that we've seen a couple times and it's happening in immunology as well, is that once you have a drug that works, then you can set up the diagnostics to figure out who it works and why, and then you develop another drug and it goes back and forth in circles. And I think what's happened in, in immunotherapy has been the development of the first drug that worked, and all of a sudden now we know, okay, it relates to mutation burden, it relates to the way that antigens are presented. All of a sudden there's a reason behind all the science, the diagnostics can move forward and so can the therapeutics. And once that wheel starts turning, it can go very, very fast. So as that wheel turns, and we all talk about big data and sharing data and horizontal planes that perhaps didn't exist in siloed academic centers before, how do you create protocols that are going to sustain themselves and really provide answers? Because people want to invest in ideas or protocols or businesses that are going to have some ROI on intellectual capital or real capital. So we've got a community of, of uh, the world community of medicine out there looking at individual patients and saying, you know, I see features of this patient. They, I know they need something from me, and I have a bunch of guesses about what I might be able to give them. Example, patient with a mutation in their colon cancer where there's a drug out there that can fight that, but it's never been tested before. What do we do now? We beg the company for the drug, we give it to them, we see if it works. What we need in the future is for every single patient to be treated in that manner, to have their information recorded, shared, and analyzed so that we can make progress in this world right now, which a lot of times, I hate to tell you, medicine is kind of hit or miss, trying to do the best for the patient in front of us. I think there's also a big challenge to the way that we reimburse care in this country. Mm -hmm. So we, we reimburse drugs extremely well, but we don't reimburse the diagnostics that tell you whether they'll work or not. Mm -hmm. We reimburse somebody's tumor shrinking from this size to that size, but we don't always reimburse as well, preventing it from recurrence. So in some way, the more we have effective therapies and the more we have effective diagnostics, we may have to change the way that the whole clinical paradigm works. Because ultimately, cancer prevention or early detection belongs in the primary care clinics. It's a general medicine problem, not an oncology problem. And the whole way in which the system works now is really waiting for someone to have a symptomatic cancer, be diagnosed, and have treatment at a relatively late stage. And that's, that's a big challenge, both in terms of the way we, imbur we reimburse cancer and the way we manage medicine as well. And when patients walk in here for the first time that he or she has cancer, and I happen to agree with you, I think the, the, the immediate war mentality goes up. You turn on my immune system, chomp up those aliens, and mm -hmm. you know, game on. But then the other word always creeps in, and I'm never quite comfortable with our role in using it, and that's the word cure. Mm. You know, everyone talks about five years, but we know about tumors that come back 25 years later. So what's the responsible message, regardless of whatever field anybody in this audience is in, 
what are the hopes on the horizon and what's the reality check? I think the, the, the best news on that front actually came out of our clinics at MGH when we have no room for patients. Because in fact, all our patients are living so much longer that they're coming back for follow-up visits. And in fact, you know, it, it hits you kind of in a subtle way that way, that people are living with cancer much, much longer than they ever did before. We're setting up survival clinics. We're wondering about how to meet their other needs, the complications of the therapies, both physical and emotionally as well. So in some way, I would say the most encouraging aspect of this is the growth in the survivorship movement. We'll hear some about this in, the, in this meeting as well. Mm -hmm. I, I think the perspective I like the best is one that works equally well for the person who has something very early and you want to not overtreat, and also works well for the person who has a disease that we just know we, is eventually going to hurt them. And that is to approach it clinically as my job is to make sure this tumor never hurts you. It doesn't change your life in a negative way. And if I can do that best by taking it out, um, hopefully with little cost to you, your little trauma to you, or if I can do that best by watching a while till it does something, or if I can do that best by something that is therapeutically powerful, though that's where we should go. Not after cure, but after never harm. Let's talk about money for a second. R01s are drying up, NCI budgets are decreasing, NIH is decreasing, uh, patient advocacy groups are increasing, Stand Up, for Cancer, Stand Up to Cancer has been a huge financial success. What does the landscape look like now for academic R&D in oncology? When money gets tight, you have to work together a lot more than when anybody can get a big grant and do whatever they want. So one of the positive effects has been to really force team work that has not happened before. That's great. The other positive effect is to, has been a much closer, I think, collaboration with the public in public-private partnerships to try to achieve, um, achieve the goals that we need to do. And, and third, I think the foundations, like Stand Up to Cancer and many others, their personal investment in what we're doing has huge impact. Hmm. You know, in addition to public support, support from the patient organizations themselves is very profound. Yeah, I agree with Monica, and we've been very fortunate to have support from Stand Up to Cancer, which has been incredibly motivating, both financially and emotionally and personally as well. What I would add is that we're in a magic time in cancer treatment where for the last 10 years, you see the realization of so much science translationally. There's a, there's a huge push for translational research because it has impact. And that's fantastic in every way. But at the, at the end of the road, you have to discover new things as well. And if everything and all the money goes to translational research, then you're really starving the source. And so many of these discoveries now still happen in individual labs, people who are looking for something interesting. And if we don't value basic discovery and fundamental science, there'll be nothing to translate in a few years. As you were putting this conference together and had to just look in the nooks and crannies of departments across the city and across the country, were you surprised that you found people working on cancer you would have never, not necessarily known if you passed them in the hallway? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we think of multidisciplinary cancer research as, you know, a basic biologist, a surgeon, maybe a medical oncologist, radiation oncologist. We're looking, we find people in um, pathology, people in, in psychiatry, um, people working in optical imaging. You know, I mean, you can just, you can, I, I don't need to list more of them. I mean, and they're all heavily invested in cancer as well as many other things. And that's the other beauty of being so multidisciplinary is we can draw so much knowledge from other fields, um, particularly the other fields of chronic disease. It's been very helpful. Well, I mean, if, if you think from a biological point of view, the cancer is about a cell. So anything that affects a cell is fascinating and has implications in cancer. And in fact, the NCI budget has supported a lot of fundamental discovery. The interesting twist that I'm imagining now is that many of the drugs that were developed for cancer may ultimately have some applications in non-cancerous conditions as well, whether it's immunology and autoimmune diseases or fibrosis and other conditions as well. So I think this kind of creative engine that is hooked up to cancer is going to have a very, very broad impact across the fields.
if the three of us had been having this conversation 20 years ago, we wouldn't have talked about colon cancer, having things in common perhaps with breast cancer or lung cancer. And now we're not only sharing thoughts among departments, we're almost sharing body parts. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny. Naively, five years ago, we said it's all genetics, and it doesn't matter what organ your BRAF mutations arises in. All tissues are the same, and it's really all genetics. And we've gone one step further from that. We now know that's not true, because in fact, the feedback pathway that enables your cell to deal with the drug is different in lung and in colon. So what we now understand, is it is genetics, but it's also tissue. And the complexity of how that works is incredibly important. Yeah. Yeah, just to expand upon that, one of the more fascinating things that's come out of, of biological insights over the last decade has been the understanding that it's not the tumor cell that's making the tumor grow. It's the neighboring stromal compartment. And maybe we don't need to fight tumor cells at all. Maybe we just need to reorganize some of the processes that respond to it. Um, and that will be enough. That's interesting. So if you look back at your academic growth, your intellectual growth over the last 10 years, what supposition did you have at one time which you now know not to be true? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, I'll one. start with that by saying I, I started life looking at pediatric cancers, and it was all scientifically fascinating. The impact on treatment I mean, chemotherapy had worked very well and continues to work. So it's very much of a scientific discipline, and one in which the impact in real life and real time with patients was relatively small. Since that time, I've worked on breast cancer and lung cancer now on these circulating tumor cells. And the time, from the time that you work in the lab to the time when something can happen in the clinic is much, much shorter. Mm -hmm. So it's impacted uh, my sleep habits. Um, and there's very much a sense that what you do in the lab can very quickly have an impact. And it changes what you decide is important and what you decide you want to do. Monica, how about you? Yeah, I, I started the field, I guess, in the, in the basic biology of prevention. And I have to say, I really thought we'd be further along than we are now in terms of being able to unlock that switch, you know. And I, and I do think one of, the, um, one of the disappointing things in the last 10 years is we've made great strides in what actual malignant tumors do. We've still come, not come nearly as far as I would have hoped in the very early processes of transformation that could have more impact. And what's that, what has the roadblock been? Ah. Is it the basic science? Is it there's not been enough money to look at that? Do we not have the intellectual power yet? Eh, all of the above. Hmm. All of the above. And it's hard to study a condition. Many, there are many social opt obstacles as well. It's hard to study a condition if you really don't know it's a disease. Hmm. And so many of the early tumorigenesis, um, at least human in populations doing human studies, which is what we really essentially need, um, it's very difficult to get traction there because people aren't sick. So why should they be treated? So in our remaining few minutes, I'm just going to play a dirty trick on both of you. <laughs> Daniel, tell me why there's, this is a war on cancer and not a moonshot. <laughs> I think it's a war, um, primarily because you need all kinds of different armies and different forces, and it's really a coming together of your navy, your air force, and your land and your land troops. And in some way, I don't think that any any one area, any one discipline can do it alone. They all have to work together, and they have to communicate very effectively. Monica, okay, why why is surgical oncology a moonshot? Oh, gee. I won't say surgical oncology being a moonshot, but I will say that um, the war, that cancer, cancer and conquering cancer, I, I think we agree with the same terminology. Moonshot was the US people getting together to be on the moon, something we had grand aspirations for, and we put our treasure and our technology and our dedication behind because it was something so important for our people. That's why I think. Fighting cancer is a moonshot it's the same way. Well, I want to congratulate both of you for putting together an astounding three days and for helping me kick this off. Congratulations, Monica and Daniel. And to all of you for attending, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.